Um, uh, this is, um, uh, well, it's a joint effort between the Innovative Material uh, Materials Arena and RISE. Uh, we're really happy to see you here. Um, and uh, well, my name is Bjorn Ulberg. I'm going to try and be your host, even though I know nothing of chemistry. Um, so um, I'm going to walk through this little presentation of RISE just to give you a little intro on who we are. It'll be very quick and then we'll let the floor to the speakers. Um, so my, my work normally, I'm a business development director for a department that's working with electronics. Um, but looking at RISE as a whole, we're an institute um, <clears throat> meant to help Swedish industries primarily, but we also work on an international basis. And uh, we are right now we're the fourth biggest institute in Europe. We're about 3,000 people. And we operate uh, around 120 different test beds of various kinds. <clears throat> and uh, the, the whole reason for existence is really that we were bringing together different types of competences to try and help and solve the problems of, of, of our clients. Um, and, and that said, we do that with a, with a clear focus on, on a sustainable future. It's really deep in the culture of RISE that we are working towards the global goals. Uh, and the key offering from us is really we have we have some test inspection, certification, calibration operations. Uh, we work with uh, professional education and transition management. But the core of the offer, what we do at RISE, is really applied research and development. And that can be from anything really low TR levels to high TR levels. But it's fairly uh, sort of in between acad acad academy and industry. Um, and sometimes with joint public funding, sometimes di directly towards clients under NDA, etc. Now, one of the test and demonstration facilities that we operate is called the Printed Electronics Arena. It's located in North Shipping. Uh, it's an innovation cluster uh, where we collaborate very tightly with the University in Lynn Shipping. And, and at the Printed Electronics Arena, we work with the demonstrators, with prototyping, we work with chemistry, uh, et cetera, uh, in, in, in different ways. And again, we um, have been doing this. We're one of the pioneers in, the area, in, in this area. And in working with the Linköping University, we also have an academic backbone. And then there are some um, <clears throat> spin-off companies. So this is a growing uh, um, innovation cluster, you could say. And so now working with the Innovative Materials Arena in Linköping, we're really happy that we're sort of expanding this network. Um, <clears throat> and that said, uh, I'd just like to show you the agenda for today. <clears throat> so we're going to start out with Christian Lorsan from Umeå University um, in just a couple of moments. And then we're moving on with Robert from RISE and Igor Sosulenko from Model One, which is a startup company, uh, spin-off, you could say, from uh, Liu. And then uh, the final presenter today is Anna Jacob from RISE Substitution Center. We're going to try and help moderate this. Uh, but please, uh, please ask questions after the, the, the speaker's um, presentations. And then literally I'll leave the floor to Ingela uh, and, and then onwards to Christian. Okay. Uh, great to see everybody here, almost everybody, I can see anyway. Uh, and as Bjorn said, uh, this is a a joint effort between not only IMA and, uh, and PIA, but also Umeå University, I would say, and, uh, and HOPE. So uh, we're, uh, we're all very happy to see you here. Um, uh, and some a few words about IMA. I don't have any slides on that, but uh, IMA, Innovative Materials Arena, is, the, is coordinating the strength area of Region Östergötland uh, in advanced materials. So we uh, are the coordinators for uh, the different innovation clusters, uh, in, including, uh, including ourselves and, and HOPE uh, in Östergötland and trying to advance this area of expertise and uh, business in Östergötland. So we uh, are actually a, a member organization with uh, like 80 uh, members, large and small corporations, organizations, uh, uh, so you're very happy to, to join us if you're interested in this area of expertise and uh, development. Um, what else to say? Yeah, we, uh, we organize these kind of seminars uh, regularly uh, and we also have uh, 
project fundings, uh, network activities of all different kinds. And uh, well, uh, let's let's have a look in uh, into our website if you if you want to more say more about us, hear more about us. So uh, that's that's everything, Bjorn. Uh, I think we'll uh, we'll we'll do what people are here to to listen to now uh, to listen to the speakers. So Christian Larsen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Then I will uh, close my video so I can share the screen properly. Um, so hopefully you will see the, uh, the presentation slide now and uh, you will hear me as well. We hear you fine, and it's the presentation fine. seems all right, yes. Great. Uh, so then I would start. So my name is uh, Christian Larsen. Um, I'm a research engineer in the Organic Photonics and Electronics Group at the Department of Physics uh, in, uh, at Umu, Umu University. And I'm also involved in a startup company. It's called Lunalek that tries to commercialize the, the things that we do here. Um, so I've worked quite a lot with solvents. So this is kind of started out as a like a personal worry that the solvents I'm working with can be harmful. So how do I find something that is much nicer to work with? So the goal of this talk is then to kind of motivate you to uh, consider the solvents that you're working with. I noticed that there's quite a lot of different kind of people in this uh, in this call. So both researchers, there's also people from industry. So there's quite a lot of different backgrounds here. So I can say that from a researcher's perspective, it's quite nice to just know that you're working with friendly solvents. Uh, so this is a good motivation. But it's also important that you consider that the thing that you do in the lab when you're a researcher can actually become something big in, in an industrial process in the future. So it's like the, the solvent choices that we make already here can be important like in the long run as well. Uh, from an industrial perspective, it's also quite important that we, uh, we use green solvents because it can mean that we have safer work environments, for instance. Uh, green solvents, they also come with less restrictions uh, when it comes to regulations and handling, shipping and so on. And it's also simpler to dispose, uh, has lower impacts on the environment and so on. So there's, there's many reasons why both researchers and industrial people should care about using green solvents. So ideally, we want to use the most friendly option that's available. Uh, the tricky part is finding which one that is. Um, so this is something that I realized myself as well. So the talk here is I'm going to show you how we solve this problem. And we made a tool, basically, that helps you, you do this. And from our perspective, from the printed electronics um, field, uh, we have defined functionality in a certain way. So I will go through this. Uh, so in short, we have developed a free web tool that's available for everyone to use that lets you simplify this process of finding green solvent. Uh, so I will talk about a little bit how these, this tool then ranks the greenness so you can understand what's behind the number that we, we use to, to separate the different solvent in terms of greenness. Uh, and also how we rank functionality. Uh, and in this case, we rank it based on the solubility of materials. We want to use solvents to dissolve materials. It's very typical for printed electronics. And in the end of this talk, I will do something a little bit unconventional, which means I will go to the actual web page and I will show you the tool a little bit. So just show you how to use it. So I think you start with just talking about the hazards of working with solvents. Um, and the simplest way to know if a solvent is dangerous is just really to look at the bottle because there are these labels on it, as you've probably seen. Uh, and these labels, they come from a uh, classification system that's called the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling of chemicals, which we for short say is GHS. Uh, so this is an attempt to then uh, harmonize the, the labeling or, and the, the information that we have for each solvent on a global level so that no matter where you are you should be able to to know if a solvent is dangerous or not based on the same data and based on the same labels 
And you can see some examples of these labels here on the, on the picture. So you have a harmful, for instance, health hazards. You've probably seen this. Uh, if something is toxic, you have the, the skull on it. And environmental toxicity, flammable. These are just some examples, but there are more as well. And each bottle should have these. But on top of this, you also have some uh, safety data sheets that you can find, uh, which comes with each solvent. So when you buy a solvent, you should be able to get a safety data sheet from the provider, which then uh, includes this information from the GHS, um, specifies how, how dangerous it is. Uh, and this safety data sheet, it contains then the known hazards. So basically the, um, what, what is dangerous with the solvent. Uh, and this is what's related to the labeling then as well. And you also have the handling and storage information. Uh, what to do in case of exposure, accidental release and fire. And this, this will then be different depending on which solvent you use because yeah, different solvents are dangerous in different ways. Uh, you also have the physical and chemical properties of the solvent, uh, toxicological and ecological information, uh, some transport and disposal considerations, and you also have regulatory information in this safety sheet. So it contains quite a lot of information. But all of these solvents, they, they come with this, of course, but it's, it's quite a hassle to go through all of them. Um, and you don't really know what's a green solvent just based on this data sheet. Uh, there is more information that you need to, to look into in order to determine what is actually a green solvent. So generally, we say that a green solvent uh, is something that is, has a low impact uh, on both workers and environment. So there's no real clear definition of what a green solvent is. Uh, it's a bit blurry. But in general, when people talk about green solvents, they generally agree that it, it needs to have a low health hazard for workers, for instance. Uh, it needs to be safe to handle and transport, simple to recycle and dispose of. It needs to have a low impact on the environment. So these are the main things. Uh, and in some cases, you also talk about green solvents in terms of if they are produced from renewable sources or not. But this is not always in, in, involved though. So there are a few guides uh, that are available uh, that have tried and attempted to, to classify a bunch of solvents as green or not. So they look at the available data essentially, they collect it uh, and they evaluate it, compare it to each other, and then they rank solvents basically on, on the hazards and uh, how dangerous it is in the different categories. And there are a number of these available that you can look up. Um, so for instance, ACS, American Chemical Society, they have, they have their own. Uh, the medical industry has quite a few of them. Uh, so there are some uh, collaborations like the Chem 21 that uh, consists of many different groups that then try to make up their own uh, classification. You also have companies doing their own like Pfizer, Sanofi and uh, GlaxoSmithKline. They have their own publications when it comes to the greenness. Uh, and they all, they all use different uh, information from different sources, but this uh, GHS globalized uh, system is good because then they, it kind of harmonizes the, the available data. So uh, many of them use this as well, which means that they start with the same data as well. Uh, and the thing that they, they then compare is the, the, the solvent properties. They rank them slightly differently because they are in different uh, industries, of course. Uh, and they try to then determine which one is the best and which one is the worst. Um, so they make a ranking based on this. And even though the, the methods that they use, uh, they can de actually differ a little bit between the different uh, who, who has made this uh, greenness evaluation. Uh, even though they value the def data differently, they, they actually tend to agree on the conclusions. And this is something that's quite reassuring when you're trying to figure out what's a green solvent or not. So if you have many different um, uh, evaluations that show the same conclusion, that, that means that, okay, this has to be something to this. Uh, so this is something that is reassuring. 
So for us, what we did, we, we selectively chose one of these uh, uh, published uh, guides, which is uh, published by GlaxoSmithKline or GSK. This is a medical company that uh, makes quite a lot of known medicines that you buy in the, in the pharmacy. And they published a solvent sustainability guide uh, like way back in the early 2000s, I think it was the first time. And the good thing about this guide is that they, they are very clear in the methods they use to calculate the greenness score. Uh, and they base this greenness score also on the GHS data so that we talked about earlier. Uh, another good thing is that they are it's frequent, frequently updated. So the last publication is in 2016. Um, so they have updated this uh, the greenness score based on new data then, uh, a few times already. Uh, so this is also something that is reassuring when it comes to how, how good this data is. Uh, another thing is that it also uh, penalizes solvents that has insufficient data. So there are a few examples where there is not not enough data known for a specific solvent. It's maybe it's a new one uh, that's not been used for so many different things. So there's like lacking data in the data set. And if it if it is like this, then they they give it a lower score intentionally just so that they don't give it a high score <laughs> uh, uh, to trick you basically. So based on the lack of data, they rather give it a lower score to compensate for this. Uh, until then, they do a new update and they get better data. And they also use a simple 1 to 10 scoring system uh, for the subcategory, where 1 is basically it's a not green solvent or a, or a bad solvent, a toxic solvent, and a 10 is a very good solvent. And this makes it very easy to compare as well, because you just put a number on it, uh, on the, each solvent that then represents the greenness. So the way that they calculate this is by um, categorizing different uh, different things. So they, they created 10 different subcategories. So here you have, for instance, health hazards, uh, exposure potential. This is how dangerous a solvent is and how, how dangerous it is to humans and how likely it is to be get exposed. Uh, then you have safety uh, concerns like flammability and explosion, like how reactive this solvent is. Uh, with oxygen and with other materials. Um, they're also looking at env environmental impact, such as air impact, if it's, if it's easy for it to escape into the air and how dangerous is it if it's yeah, in the air, basically, and in the water, so in the aqueous impact. Uh, is it dangerous to water living animals, for instance? Uh, is it biodegradable that goes into the aqueous impact as well? And you also have waste disposal consideration in one category, depending on how you plan to kind of get rid of this solvent once you, you're done with it. If you want to incinerate it, so you burn it, um, then you have a score there for how easily this can be done. Uh, if you want to recycle it, you have a score for that. Uh, Biotreatment, if it's mixed with water, for instance, and you want to yeah, separate it, um, that, that can have a uh, different score and volatile organic compounds is basically how easy it is for it to uh, get out in the air um, and spread. So they have a bunch of different subcategories here that's kind of relevant for how, how dangerous this, this material is, the solvent is. And they separate that into the, the categories then. So you have categories out here. So health, safety, environment, waste disposal. These are the four categories that they uh, define. And then based on these scores, so each, each subcategory has a score from one to 10 here. And these subcategories are then calculated into a category score uh, like this. And this is just a geometric mean of these subcategory scores. So you can see that they calculate geometric mean for each of these. And down here, it's the four square root to, in order to get this. The good thing with this geometric mean of a arithmetic mean is that you, you actually penalize if one of these values is low and the other one is high, then you get a lower score overall. So that low one drags the score down essentially. And that is also something that you want in the end if you, you don't want a solvent that's kind of pushed up because it has one high score in one of these, but not in the other one. 
Uh, and in the end, they calculate a composite score, which is then just a collective score for this entire solvent and all of these uh, subcategories. And this is also the geometric mean of the category scores. Then. So this is the how the tool defines greenness. Um, so we also want to uh, define functionality. And this was the, the real usefulness of this tool. And for us, uh, we need to dissolve the, the solutes in the solvent to form a functional ink. This is, this is how we make electronic devices. Uh, but this can also be, if you're in the synthesis uh, lab, for instance, this, this can be also very useful. Uh, and we base uh, our approach here on Hansen solubility parameters uh, with a lamp, uh, like dissolves like approach. So Hansen solubility parameters uh, is defined for each solvent and it describes uh, the intermolecular interactions between the solvents, solvent molecules, uh, and also the solutes. And these can be broken down into three different terms. So it's dispersion interactions, uh, which is basically induced dipoles in the molecules. Uh, you have polar interactions, which is, which is done uh, permanent dipoles. Uh, and then you have hydrogen bonding, which is just a type of very strong polar interaction. And each of these can be assigned a value uh, based on the strength of this interaction for each, sol uh, for each solvent. Then. Each molecule can have a specific value for each of these interactions. And this means that you can plot uh, where in a three-dimensional Hansen space each solvent or material is located. And if two materials are close to each other in this three-dimensional plot, that means that they have very similar interactions. So that means that the likelihood that they are, can dissolve each other is very high. And this is the approach that we used. So if you then put everything together, you can get a plot like this. Um, so what we have here, each, each point here, each circle is, uh, is a solvent in a three-dimensional Hansen space. So this is the hydrogen bonding, polarity, and dispersion. Um, so each point here is a solvent. And you can see that some of them are marked out here. You can see water is separated here, which is kind of showing you how special water is as a solvent. And the size of these circles and the, the color of it is defined by the greenness score. Um, so you can see that this, this clearly shows kind of the, the possibility with this tool here. Because you can see that there's quite a lot of big greens dispersed throughout a lot of these small red ones. So this means that you have quite a lot of bad options, but there are also good ones close by. Uh, and this is what we're trying to kind of figure out. We want to identify the green ones close to which red ones. So we know which solvents are preferable over uh, some other solvents, basically. And to help with this, we also define the distance in this plot. So the distance between two points here, two solvents, is given by the uh, RA in this case. Uh, this is just a distance that we calculate uh, and use as a sorting tool uh, later on in the tool, as I will show. And this helps you identify which solvents are close because a small RA a distance will then be a solvent that is very like in the solubility parameter. So it will be a good option as a replacement. So that is enough talking about the, uh, the background of the tool. So I want to actually show something now. So let's see. Now we should be able to see the actual tool here. So I will go through the tool so you can see what, uh, what it's capable of here. So in the middle here, you have the same plot as I showed before, but here you can actually rotate it so you can kind of see it from different angles. Uh, you can cl clearly get a picture of how, uh, yeah, the possibility that you can uh, use this tool for. So you see here that you have a cluster of really green ones in the middle here. Out here, you don't have that many options. There are quite a lot of bad ones. Um, all the hydrocarbons you have along the line here, they are not polar at all. So this is not zero polarity, but they are, have a lot of dispersion forces. Uh, so you find them all down here. And they're all quite bad. 
to be honest, uh, when it comes to the green mass. So you can rotate this. Uh, if you find a solvent that you like, for instance, ethanol here, we can click on it. And then we can get some information on the screen to the side here. So we see the chemical structure. We get some uh, basic uh, physical parameters, uh, like the melting point, boiling point, viscosity of the solvent, and surface tension. Uh, and we also have the greenness score uh, that is calculated for this solvent. We see the composite score, 6.6. Uh, it's not super green. And this is mostly because of the uh, uh, the waste management for for ethanol it kind of takes down the score. So if you hold over these category scores, you can see the subcategory scores divided. You can see the health part is very good, environmental part is quite good, and the safety part is also quite good. And the, the reason why the safety is not 10 here is because it's quite flammable. And the reason why the waste is low here is because it, uh, it's tricky to purify ethanol because it mixes with water and forms an azeotrope. Um, so this makes it a little bit tricky to recycle it. And down here, you also have uh, the GHS statements, uh, which is then the hazard statements that you can find the safety data sheets as well. So you can see that it's highly flammable, cause a serious eye irritation and may cause damage to organs. This is things that we, we already know, basically. So that's the, the graph and the information. Uh, on the left here, you can see that there is a list as well. So this is all the solvents that are included in this tool. So it's quite a long list of solvents uh, that's available. You can see that there's uh, ability, you can sort it by greenness, for instance. So this is a greenness, a greenness column here. So you can sort this, get the highest first and then in, uh, in lower below it. You can sort it by boiling point, um, uh, viscosity and surface tension. And we can also go into refinement options. So if we click here, then we can do some simple sorting based on the, the data here as well. So if we keep an eye on the, on, the, on the plot here when we change things. So for instance, here we can uh, set a lower limit for, for the greenness that we want to include. So if we are not interested in any greenness that's lower than, than six, for instance, we can drag this up to six and then we can click update. And then we can see that, okay, now it excluded all the solvents that does not fulfill this criteria. So we can only see the green options now. And this list is also updated. So now it only includes the green alternatives. You can also change boiling point range, for instance. Uh, depending on what application you're, you're after, you might not need very high boiling point. Um, so you can drag this down. You might need a specific boiling point, so you can set the range. You can click update again. And you can see that now you refine, further refine the, the alternatives that you have available for you. So this is quite useful when it comes to like finding good, good solvents. Uh, a nice feature is also that you can select your own greenness calculation here down. So uh, in this case, uh, you can, for instance, choose to say that you don't want to burn your uh, your solvent, so you don't you don't need to care about this one. Uh, you also don't you have no idea if you want to bio treatment uh, included as well. So you will you want to recycle basically. So you include the recycling and VOC emission, but you can exclude these two. Uh, so then you can recalculate the greenness score excluding these two. So you just select what you want to include, and then you click update again. And then you can see that there's actually a change to the values here. Uh, so the greenness is now recalculated. And you can also exclude based on hazard statements here. So, so let's say that we don't want anything that's extremely flammable. Uh, so we can take away this hazard statement and we can take away highly flammable. You can pick, pick any of these and uh, how many you want here. You click update, you can see that the graph updates again, so you can exclude exactly what you want to exclude. 
And this is quite useful if you have something that you definitely don't want to work with. So you can take away carcinogenic, for instance, here, uh, which is something that is quite nasty to work with. So let's see, as a last step, uh, I wanted to just show uh, how you can actually define the functionality in this tool as well. So we talked about the handsome solubility parameters and how they are useful to, to find similar solvents. Uh, and we included this in the, in the tool here as well. So up on the left here, you have two options. So either if you know the Hansen solubility parameters of your solute, you can put that in here. So let's say that we know it, put in the values 10, 10, 10, just for example. And you click update. So then it will show you your solute is over here. Uh, this is now a very, <laughs> it's very far away from all of the solvents. But what it does now is that it calculates the distance between this point, which is your solute, and all of the solvents in the data set. And then it sorts the list here based on this distance. So RA, you remember, is the distance. So that means that the closest uh, solvents here now are the, the most likely to actually dissolve your solute. And this is a very good way to uh, sort which options are, are best for your purpose. So in the case that you don't know uh, which uh, Hansen parameter your solute is, which is kind of most of the cases, I would say, then you can go by uh, unknown solvent instead. So let's say that you know that a certain solvent dissolves your material, then you can define it here, uh, which one, which solvent that is. So an example for us was that we wanted to replace chlorobenzene. So what this one does when you include chlorobenzene here is that it approximates your solute with the Hansen parameter of the solvents that you put in here. So if you put in more, it will approximate with the mean of these uh, Hansen parameters. So when you click update here, it will mark out chlorobenzene. And this is now the position for your solute. And then it will calculate the distance based on this position instead to all of the solvents. And you can see here, for instance, that, okay, and now we have some options here, but this is not that much greener. Uh, we have a toxic benzene, for instance, which could be an uh, interesting alternative. So if you look in the plot here, you can see that this big green one there is an option. You can also see that if we scroll down a little bit, we should find we have uh, anisole there is an option. And we also have something cyclohexanone there is a green option. And if we want to simplify this, we can include this uh, refinement option here as well. So let's say that we only want uh, the really green ones. Christian? Yes. I just want to draw your attention to that uh, the, the, the time is almost up. Um, okay, I'm pretty much done. a little bit of room to conclude and also for questions. I am actually pretty much done. Uh, so we can... Uh, I can go back to the presentation maybe then. And uh, the thing I have left is the summary. Uh, so basically what we've done is developed a, a free green solvent selection tool. And it uses uh, GSK data as a, for the greenness. And it ranks functionality based on similar insolubility. Uh, it allows you to filter for certain properties so that you can actually find something that is suitable for your application. And the idea is that it's easy to use and very powerful for its purpose. So then I thank you for listening and uh, hopefully I don't didn't go over too much. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Super interesting, uh, beautiful um, tool and work behind. I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be open source forever. Um, so are there any any questions from the forum? And if you have questions, please turn on your camera and say a little bit who you are and what kind of company you represent, etc. We have four minutes to go. And there's also the link in the chat to the tool if you want to play around with it. Uh, I have a short question. Mm. Do you hear me? Uh, Britt-Marie Vidheden from uh, CM Group in Gothenburg. 
Uh, is this tool available even for us? Is it? Yes. Or is it uh? Uh, anyone can access. Um, I don't know if was it was it shared in the chat. Otherwise, I can do this too. It's in the yeah. chat. Yeah, it is in it's the in chat. It's in the chat. Ah, okay, perfect. So there's there's this link as well. Um, mm. So that one will always uh, point towards the right link, even if we change the, the, the host for this. But it's open for everyone, yes. Mm -hmm. You also have a question from David. Yes, yes. Uh, hello, Christian. Thank you very much for the, your presentation. It seems to be a um, very useful tool. Uh, and I, I'm, I work at, at a company called Invisible. Uh, we work in, in printed electronic business. And um, I was wondering if you have any suggestions for how to evaluate the harmfulness of a solvent, if you find one using this tool, and you, you, you can see that it contains some compounds that are harmful, but you don't really know what concentration levels you have when working with this solvent. Do you have a, a good way of evaluating whether or not there's something to worry about because I, I, I have, for instance, evaluated a, a solvent containing heavy aromatics and we have a mm -hmm. VOC reader, but I don't think it gives very accurate readings of the heavy aromatic compounds since they're, they're not very volatile. So I don't really know what, what uh, concentrations to expect when handling the solvent. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, the, the amount of VOCs you get, it will depend on the boiling point, of course. So. Yes. Uh, high boiling point, you don't get very much vapor. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, the, the greenness score that you have for, uh, if you break down the score, for instance, uh, there is a health score, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the health hazard is, is based on uh, these uh, exposure limits oh. for, like, for, for the different solvents. And uh, so, and that is included uh, the VOC emissions, basically. So how how much vapor you have from the solvent. Uh, so they, they calculate it based on how dangerous it is per per vapor, and then how much vapor you have, basically. Uh, so you you can use that as a kind of a indicator, I think, if something is dangerous or not. Uh, so okay. in your case, I, I, I would maybe go to the tool and then I can look at specifically this one uh, to see. So the, so in this tool, they, they are, have actually found out how much vapor you have from particular uh, ingredients. They, they, go, they go by oh, the that. boiling point or the vapor pressure. Um, mm -hmm. So this, but, is, yeah. this is the simple, uh, uh, simple way of doing it. Uh, and then uh, but of they, course it they, also there's spreads an exposure out limit. The there, yeah, sure. Uh, that because is I, I, that is what I also did. I mean, you, you can calculate mm. the concentration above the surface. So <coughs> David, David and Christian, sorry to interrupt. First, we have a hand raised from Robert to comment maybe, but also Robert is our next speaker. Uh, and I'm thinking you're moving into details. Maybe you could take this, uh, have, uh, take a meeting afterwards, maybe with Robert on as well, because he's uh, he might be giving give you some insights into the problem as, too. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say thank you to Christian. Thank you, David, for the questions. And over Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, okay. I had a question, but uh, since it's going to be cutting into my own time, maybe I'll talk to Christian afterwards uh, and I sure. share my screen instead. Please, please save questions also for, we have, uh, we have some room for, for questions in the end also. also. So uh, that would be some, some time over uh, for questions. So uh, just uh, remember your questions and ask them at the end of this seminar also. If you like. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you can see my screen. Looks looks good and sounds good. Perfect. Uh, yeah. So thanks. Uh, my name is Robert Brook, uh, and I'm from uh, Rise, and I work at the Printed Electronics Arena. And this presentation was actually meant to be given by Matt Sandberg, um, but instead I'm taking over. Uh, and I have yeah, pretty much the same job as Matt. So I'm also a kind of a chemist here at the Print Electronics Arena. And we work with yeah, making inks, testing inks, and putting them into um, different products, so different print electronics applications. Uh, so we'll go a little bit into how we make our material choices. Um, and Bjorn talked a little bit about the Print Electronics Arena. 
but I have a little animation here that goes into a little bit more detail. So I'll play that for you and then I'll get into Matt's presentation after that. Here at the Printed Electronics Arena, we have a vision. That vision is the development of green electronics to replace traditional electronics with materials that are forest-based or have a production with a reduced environmental impact. We're working with materials that are ready to be implemented into devices and through our close collaboration with our partners, such as universities, we are investigating new materials that have potential within the near future. This is an example of a hybrid printed and flexible electronic prototype manufactured at the Printed Electronics Arena by researchers at the Research Institutes of Sweden. The prototype contains functional components created through printing and processing procedures. These include printed circuitry, an antenna, a sensing component, an energy harvester, energy storage, a display component as an indicator, and to create an integrated system, a silicon processing chip. Some of the materials incorporated into these hybrid electronic prototypes have been processed from sustainable and environmentally friendly sources, such as forests and plants. Taking these materials and developing them into functional inks allows printing technology to be used. Materials based on carbons, silver, electrolytes, and dielectrics have been developed for screen printing to be layered, organized, and aligned in specific ways to create functional components. Once the inks have been printed and cured, the substrates are moved to an integration unit using pick and place technology to precisely place traditional silicon technology to complete the hybrid system. The technology can be used in a variety of applications, some of which include health monitoring, drug sensing, sustainable energy solutions, and display technologies. Finally, at the device's end of life, with the silicon components removed, the remaining components, since they are composed of bio-based and environmentally friendly components, can either be recycled or disposed of in more responsible processes. Okay, so that gave you a bit of a idea of what we're doing at the Print Electronics Arena. Uh, it's my voice, my voice over the top, so technically it's still me giving the presentation. Um, but it doesn't really go into Here at the uh, why we're doing printing. And printing is kind of the cheapest way to patent materials. And so if we can do it for electronics, then if you think about printing electronics, like you print newspapers, you can definitely do it in a cheaper. And yeah, if you talk about printing on paper, you can definitely make it more sustainable than it is. I mean, we've all seen these images of the piles of electronic trash. So if we make electronics uh, more sustainable and recyclable, then uh, the world's going to be a better place. Um, it's also, yeah, definitely more cost effective if we can print in those kind of volumes, uh, things get a lot cheaper. But there are problems. Uh, for example, we deposit the ink uh, by different sort of printing technologies. So uh, in the animation, we saw a lot of uh, screen printing, but there's also printing technology like inkjet printing, uh, slot die coding, uh, and yeah, there's a few others. And yeah, what happens or what the problem is, is where you have to solidify that ink. So by the curing step, um, and that can be a big problem. Uh, and yeah, Christian really hit the nail on the head when he talked about the green solvents and why it's important. Um, in the print electronics arena, we have some open areas where the printing is done. And so we really need uh, inks and solvents that are a bit more, um, yeah, employee friendly, let's say, and the, the hazards are not so great. So we can protect ourselves and then the products that we're putting out are safe to handle. So it's very important for us. Uh, so when it comes to inks and how we cure them, there's a few different ways. You can do solvent drying, which is basically a big oven and the solvent evaporates. There's UV curing, which is uh, again, kind of using a UV oven that you uh, go through a conveyor system and uh, electron beam curing which is another one that's quite uh, quite fast. Um, they will have their kind of good and bad uh, properties. Um, but yeah, with the solvent drying, that's where we have uh, some big issues. If it's a bad solvent, then you're really releasing it into uh, the system, unless you have uh, some extraction that we have here. Um, it can, depending on what solvent it is and how bad it is, 
uh, you have different levels of extraction, um, but we try to avoid any bad solvents here at the print electronics arena. Uh, the UV curing systems, uh, they maybe can be better because it's not being released into the workplace, but there's also a toxicity uh, yeah, problem there because if you think about acrylates, there's always some unreacted monomer there and uh, yeah, it's not good to have on your skin. Um, and the same with the electron beam, you have some molecular fragments that can come out and uh, affect and exposed to different people. Um, when we talk about the chain of inks and how it comes to the end user, um, so we have different levels of different, you know, different examples of different companies making raw materials and binder materials, and they're kind of limited or I guess checked by this reach uh, organization or leg legislation. Uh, it's basically checks on what the hazard levels are on binders and, and raw materials. And then you have the ink formulators and the printers and the customer and the end user, which is not under this legislation. Um, but yeah, so there's different, uh, different companies that are limited by different uh, legislation, but the printed electronics, uh, maybe the next one. Yeah, so in the uh, print electronics, we're more in the printing and uh, ink formulation. Um, there is a little bit of binding molecules. So using uh, nanocellulose technically is a binding material, but um, maybe not under the same uh, category. Um, so mainly we're doing ink formulation and testing it by printing and then passing it on to the customer, which then de develop it further. Uh, and how we select our solvents. Uh, I mean, there's different ways you can do it. Um, a lot of people would follow literature recipes uh, and yeah, saying with what they know, so existing processes or transitions, uh, traditions. Uh, but nowadays we're more, I mean, thinking about what we're doing and the effect it has on the employees and, and further on. So, you know, life cycle analysis is important and the hazards and toxicology, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute about what we look into, but also sustainability is a big one. So we want to, um, yeah, use inks that are sustainable and then make products that are sustainable so that they can either be recycled or reused um, for later use. So the solvents accepted it, uh, yeah, the open uh, print workshop. Uh, this is our online um, virtual tour. So here we have the print electronics arena, the main print room. So this is a semi-automatic printer, we call it deck. So an operator would stand here and they would print uh, in this. And then once it comes out, you turn around and put it into the oven here. And this oven uh, can both do um, heat and UV curing. So you can see that if you're printing here, you have uh, some exposure to an ink. So you really need to make sure that the inks coming in are not any way dangerous for that operator, uh, let alone afterwards when it's been printed and yeah, maybe a customer down the line will touch it. So it's important that these inks are evaluated, uh, especially the solvents so that nothing bad will happen to that employee. Uh, so this one is especially, yeah, no hazardous materials in this. And so our employees are safe. Uh, one important thing, should mention green in publications. Um, I mean, we've read a lot of literature reports that say that this is a green solvent. One kind of, I guess, example that I can think of is ionic liquids, which are a kind of molten salt. And they're considered green because they don't, they're not volatile, so they don't give off any um, solvent particles. So you can breathe anything in, but they're not really green, or at least some specific ones are not green and they are actually still pretty dangerous to get on your skin and you don't want to touch them. So uh, we evaluate kind of all inks coming in and make sure that they are not um, deadly for our, our, or not even hazardous for our, our uh, researchers here. Uh, this is another printing machine. It's called the Atma. It's more automatic. So we call it a semi-closed system because uh, you don't have to be around the print. Uh, so you can put the ink in, uh, you put the substrates in and it kind of does it all itself. There's no, uh, if it's a more hazardous ink, then it can be printed with no one in the room and go straight through the oven without any 
anyone being exposed. So it's a, another level of uh, kind of protecting our people here. And then the later, the other one we have is a kind of completely uh, ventilated room and the room can be shut off itself. So if someone's printing here, they can print with a, if it's really dangerous, they can print with a gas mask. Um, although we do take steps to not have this kind of printing in the print electronics arena at all. So um, we try and avoid this at all possible. So you could print here and put it in, uh, there's an oven here, but you have the ink stored in this fume hood here so that there's really no exposure um, to anyone, hopefully. And yeah, we kind of do all this with the risk assessment process. So it basically comes through and I'm part of the risk assessment process. Uh, along with a few other my colleagues and we kind of evaluate the ink, look at the MSDS, what solvents are used, uh, what type of materials are involved in the ink and if it can be printed and where it can be printed and then decide uh, if it can be printed or not or if we, we've for a few other, for a few different um, companies we've actually said no we can't print this here so uh, you need to find a different ink or a different solvent for the, the particles in the ink and yeah to keep our people safe and yeah, also afterwards, if we're printing for a customer that they going to handle it, we need to make sure that they, yeah, they have, they can safely handle it. Uh, so just a quick case study of an ink that we made it a bit more environmentally friendly. Um, this work, nanocellulose based carbon ink for print electronic uh, or printed electrochromic displays and super, cap super capacitors uh, was published and basically it was taking a carbon ink or we use a commercial carbon ink. Uh, I think it has toluene as the solvent. And instead we replace that solvent with propylene gly glycol, which is some sort of, it can be a food additive, but on Christian's, uh, I quickly took a screenshot of uh, propylene glycol. It's quite a green uh, solvent. So uh, that was very good for my presentation. Um, and it's using nanocellulose as the binder. So it really is making this a more green um, ink. Uh, and the last part of this is really to, or the next step I should say, is to make the carbon black that we used um, to make it the food grade carbon block, black. And actually this, while it had lower connectivity in the end, um, it still functioned very well for displays and actually even better for the energy storage applications that we had. So um, yeah, you do have a bit of a trade-off if you're using different solvents that may be not as good, but uh, it can still be possible to make and it still works. So uh, it was yeah, a success in our, in our eyes. And we're also using this for different, uh, different projects and different products instead of the commercial carbon. Um, it's also a lot cheaper. So that was good for us too. Um, yeah, but I think uh, that was it for me and, uh, and Matt's. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them. And yeah, this, I can put up the, um, in the chat, I can put up where to find this paper if you want to read more about it. So yeah, thanks very much. Great, Robert, thank you. So do we have any questions for, for Robert? Um, Awfully silent. You never know with webinars if people have all disappeared or still. Are you still around, guys? <clears throat> yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So, uh, if we don't have any questions, we could move on to the next speaker. I'm wondering, should we take a break, Angela, or should we just keep on keep on going? I don't, uh, I haven't prepared for any breaks. I thought that people would be able to concentrate in two hours, but uh, we have a few minutes. So if you like to have four minutes break, that's, uh, that's fine. You decide, you decide. I, I'd suggest we keep to the schedule that we, we start 11 sharp in four minutes. So everybody can stretch a bit, get a coffee and we'll convene again in four minutes. All right. Good. Thanks.
All right. Igor, are you around? Hello, 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 hello. hello. Oh, great. So we'll we'll time it shortly so everybody has a chance to get back in time. <clears throat> Have you been well, doing nice. any exercise, Bjorn, in the meanwhile? Have you been doing any exercises in the meanwhile? No, I got a coffee. That's exercising. Coffee. Okay. Counts, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it counts. Walking down, walking down the stairs. Not yeah. <laughs> it counts. <laughs> yeah. So uh, welcome back for those who went away. Um, um, we have our next speaker, Igor, from the uh, Model 1 spin-off. Uh, from the Liu I, uh, the Institute University, please the, take the floor. Thank you. Uh, so let me share screen. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, my name is Igor Sosolenko. Uh, I am uh, with a Laboratory of Organic Electronics at Linköping University, but uh, now I am presenting uh, Model 1. So, who we are? Uh, so, we are a startup uh, in uh, early stage of development and we provide computational modeling, simulation, virtual screening and design of novel materials. Uh, for different different fields. So basically, uh, we, our expertise is rooted in academia, so we represent the Chopin University at KTH, so there are people behind us, and also we have behind us Microsoft, so Director of Strategies, Microsoft is one of our founders. Uh, so what is who we are and what is our vision? So we believe that uh, current uh, in the we live in the world which is empowered by supercomputers big data machine learning and therefore we strongly believe that materials and drug development of tomorrow will be pretty much different from it's used to be yesterday where computational material design replacing traditional trials and errors method uh, okay before i proceed i just want to mention that i will start with a brief presentation of who we are, and then uh, Alexander Mechanjinsky, who is uh, one my, my colleague at Model 1, he will uh, go through some case representative case studies, uh, what we can do uh, in terms of, of green solvents. Okay, so uh, a little bit historical background and historical development. So it's just very general information for those who are not uh, Direct, not directly in the field of computational materials. So basically everything started with foundation of quantum mechanics in the beginning of 19th century. And then uh, in the middle of 19th century, uh, there was the foundation of theoretical chemistry was laid, yeah, like names like Pauline and Marcus. And very recently, uh, novel methods of modern computational chemistry and material science have been basically they started to become a standard tool in, in material science. It's like density functional theory, multi-scale modeling using molecular dynamics. Uh, and at the same time, what we see, we see basically exponential increase in supercomputer power, like started in the 70s from Cray, Silicon Graphic Sun, and now in NVIDIA, AMD, etc. And at the same time, we have uh, new tools like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and all these three factors brings us this modern computational design, which becomes, as I said, uh, in many fields, a standard tool uh, for material developments. And basically, this is our goal, or our vision to make computer simulation and modeling the standard tool uh, in modern material discovery. Uh, and we believe that using computational simulation, modeling and machine learning, we basically save a lot of time, a lot of money for our customers. So our vision is kind of replace this old fashioned trial and error methods. When you try, fail, try, try again, and then, and then you go to success. 
so we would like to uh, replace it by kind of this straight uh, line compute try and success uh okay and i would like to say that this um, importance of this type of modeling computational design is already recognized in many fields like pharmaceutical industry biotech drug discovery where and it's actually already multi-billion dollar industry so uh, so here i just uh, show a couple of representative examples of some companies but there are many many more of them which basically do uh, uh, computational simulation and drug discovery like sertara Schoenger simulation plus and if you look at their market capitalization they're actually larger than for example SAP. and again i would like to stress that this company do just computational material discovery uh, however many traditional industries they still like behind the pharmaceutical industry biotech in the utilization of the power of uh, computational design uh, and we, we, we believe that this will change very rapidly. Uh, so, um, and also I would like to say that this type of uh, modeling, screening, design require very specialized knowledge and expertise, which is probably not available in, in many kind of traditional industries. And uh, our team, we basically yeah, possess such expertise and we can address all, all these problems uh, and the challenges. Uh, so, and this basically answers the question why to work with us, because we believe that uh, this type of computational design uh, is becoming an, a mainstream tool, providing essential insight into material properties, and then it enhances efficiency in material design. And also, uh, there is uh, many new terms, like for example, this twin factory term, where uh, it refers to to kind of computational twin factors where the product can be created and investigated virtually without the need of expensive steps uh, of actual synthesizing and designing of materials. Uh, okay, uh, so um, uh, our technology, so I will probably go very briefly. So we can do this density functional theory simulation when we kind of look at the angstrom scale, when we study electronic structure, catalytic properties. And then if we go nanometer scale, micrometer scale, we use atomistic molecular dynamics, coarse grain molecular dynamics, where we can study morphologies, mechanical properties, uh, electronic transport, ionic transport, uh, etc. And finally, on the scale of device, we can study actual, actual function of the devices. Uh, using, for example, max planck Poisson equations and using different technique of machine learning. Uh, and this is a couple of representative examples of what we can do. Uh, so this is, for example, we can study morphology of polymers, composites, ions, membranes, batteries, mechanical properties, yeah, supercapacitors, device modeling, yeah, and many, many, many other uh, things. Uh, so, and uh, this is typically what we, ca we can offer. So basically we start with a particular need, a particular research and development problem, uh, which can be, yeah, which some company can have, it can be related to yeah, this long list, fuel cell batteries, water purification, polymeric materials, composites, yeah, solvents, yeah, you name it. And then we apply our computational technology which is, as I said, density functional theory, ab initial molecular dynamics, uh, atomistic coarse grained molecular dynamics, finite element methods. Also, we have some in house development, development method. And then we can provide a you know, fully customized modeling pipeline if needed, started from the atomistic level to the device level and provide the data visualization analysis. And then we can do this virtual screening, machine learning, and uh, algorithm optimization. Uh, okay, so this was a very brief kind of give you a flavor of what we can do. And uh, now uh, Alexander can uh, take over and uh, focus more on, on computational screening of solvents. So, Alexander, please. Uh, thank you, Igor. Thank you for the. I hope uh, you hear me well. <clears throat> so, uh, 
Yes, uh, you will give a really nice uh, introduction of uh, what uh, what is Model 1 and what, what we can in principle do and we can do uh, a lot of things. We have a broad expertise in computation of physics and uh, chemistry. Uh, and so uh, now, since this is the topic is about green solvents today, uh, what I want to uh, share a few slides with you about what we can do in this respect. And uh, this is uh, about computational screening of solvents. Well, green, not green, uh, solvents in general. So, uh, and uh, of course, the first uh, the first uh, logical question is why you need this. And basically, the of course the, the answer is really simple: is to accelerate uh, what you do and uh, save money for for your company and focus on something uh, more important than to, just to look for uh, solvent formulations uh, and to do yeah consuming uh, time consuming experiments which are also not really uh, yeah are not really exciting uh, I, I know this from from my own personal <laughs> experience so also how we do this so there is uh, this tool uh, it's theory basically that it's called cosmo in principle this is the conductor screening model uh, it's the abbreviation stands uh, for, and uh, there are kind of a few flavors. One of one of it is called Cosmo RS, which basically is a multi-scale model uh, combining uh, quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, which can predict uh, different uh, thermodynamical properties, solubilities, uh, and so on of, uh, of compounds. So this is kind of the the tool that that can be used uh, in in this uh, in this case. And uh, now I want to just uh, present uh, two two cases that I picked up from uh, from the literature, which are kind of uh, I think are nice uh, representation of, of of the power of what uh, our yeah computational screening uh, can do. Uh, the first one is, uh, I would say, is more or less uh, a standard way to do this uh, screening uh, using the Cosmo RS model. Uh, for example, in this uh, uh, in this study, uh, I, I would say that this is not our study. This is from literature, but uh, it's nevertheless it's a really interesting thing. The first uh, study is about. Uh, <coughs> extracting antioxidants from the rosemary. Well, uh, rosemary is a herb. It's a, it has a lot of uh, nice molecules that help your body. So, and uh, here people wanted to extract uh, carnosol, which is antioxidant. Uh, and uh, they wanted to use deep uh, eutectic solvents. So, uh, I think Igor, we lost the full screen. And uh, yeah, first, uh, so they have a big matrix of, uh, of different solvents that uh, that are kind of their options. And uh, yeah, this 1372 option uh, combinations of, the, of these uh, diplotectic solvents. So first they do screening with Cosmo. So this is kind of a representation of the matrix that they have in this uh, contour plot uh, represents kind of a score. So this basically is the activity of the, uh, of the solvents and the solute, of course. Uh, and uh, at the end, of course, this is quite a huge number to test in the lab. So that's not uh, really something that you want to do by hand. And at the end, uh, Cosmo, uh, with this approach, they, they uh, narrow down these two Three, yeah, basically to 12 possible combinations, which is uh, quite a yeah, uh, nice uh, thing to do. And they, after that, uh, did this experimentally and so on. The second uh, example that I want to, to present is, uh, <coughs> yeah, it's a bit uh, a bit more fancy thing. <laughs> I would say this is a combination of artificial intelligence and thermodynamics, and how this can be helpful to 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 solve arson cases because obviously solving arson cases is not very easy thing to do uh, so they used uh, yeah this simple uh, formula to calculate kind of the evaporation process and in this formula you have activity coefficients of uh, of, of this 
of the accelerant in, in the, of all your molecules that consist the solvent. So this is gasoline in this case. So they predict first how the <coughs> evaporation takes places and they calculate the coefficient with Cosmo. Then they do and they can uh, predict what is the weather sample of the gasoline, which, which is can, for example, can be found in the crime scene. So then they do a backward integration using the artificial neural network and this weather sample to go back to the, to the initial sample of gasoline, for example. And in this case, they can, uh, they can relate a sample that is found in the crime scene to a sample that is found uh, in a, in a something that person uh yeah and that's uh yeah i think it's a nice combination of how computation can be helpful in the real life as well uh and finally yeah uh if we move to the next slide yeah the fi the final thing is that uh, what we can uh, provide for you as a company is that we can provide this uh, solvent uh, selection or an optimization based on uh, what you, on your particular needs for example you have some salute you want to extract uh, solvate, whatever you want to do we can uh, and you have a list of uh, solvents we can do a pre screening on the computers we can calculate thermodynamic properties, but also I think what is most powerful and nice thing to do is to optimize the solvent mixture uh, and find the best uh, yeah, molar ratio uh, solvents, uh, type of solvents and so on and so on. And uh, yeah, of course uh, we can do many more things, but I think this is kind of uh, for, for this topic is uh, really can be helpful for you. So Alexander, yeah. I, I just want to indicate time is slowly running out. Uh, we need yes, to this is uh, the, this is the last slide. So, all right. Yeah, we are done. Thank you. Thank you, model one. It feels a little bit like a dragon's den kind of thing. You're doing your initial pitches and showing the cases, the company and what you can do and etc. It's uh, super intriguing. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Hopefully quiet. Duncan. Hi. 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 Sorry for the uh, feedback. Um, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Really, really exciting. Um, I'm wondering, um, is there a way um, of sort of combining the, the theoretical computational machine learning approach with a sort of, um, uh, how would you say, the physical practical approach so that you can optimize? So it, it sort of helps the accelerate. Um, so uh, combining the sort of practical data sets with the theoretical modeling data sets um, uh, in that, how, how can you sort of uh, optimize uh, with, with the two different worlds? Uh, yes, uh, well, of course, when we, when we come to artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, Machine learning uh, it depends on uh, also on uh, a lot of data. You need a lot of data. So kind of uh, all the things that you also have from experimental point of view, whatever. Uh, I mean, the important thing is that you have data that you input. So this it doesn't matter if it comes from computational simulations or uh, real life experiments. So kind of you can first uh, have your data and you can optimize or to go how I mean, by feeding more data or, or kind of cross-checking things as well in, in, in this sense, for example. Thank you. All right. So we're uh, coming to a close almost. We have our final speaker, Anna Jacobs from RICE, the Substitution Center. Welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you, Bjorn. So I'm going to start with sharing my screen. And see if you can see it properly. 
Perfect, yes. Perfect, thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Anna Jacobs, and I'm also from RICE, like my colleagues here. And I work as the center leader for the Swedish Center for Chemical Substitution. And I'm going to tell you a little more about that is just in a moment. Uh, but I'm also representing RICE today, as I'm going to speak a little bit about the RICE rapid substitution tool that was developed by a few of my colleagues. So the Swedish Centre for Chemical Substitution is an initiative by the government. So we were founded in late um, 2017 and our mission is to inspire and support companies and public service to chemical substitution of hazardous substances. So uh, we do that by spreading knowledge and good examples of substitution. We uh, uh, are trying to act as the node for substitution activities in Sweden so that we not only provide information about the work that we do, but, but we also try to guide people and um, companies to other competences in Sweden. And uh, we have also had the possibility to uh, run a few technical projects in order to develop new tools and to give uh, to, to demonstrate ideas for good examples on, on how to uh, to provide new alternatives and, and more chemically better alternatives. So the uh, presentation today is not going to be very technical. Instead, I will try to get uh, give you an introduction to the support and the tools that we can provide. And it will be divided into parts. I will start to talk about a little bit about the substitution center. And then I will give you a brief introduction to the RISE rapid substitution tool. That is actually the work from my colleagues, Martin Andersson and Petro Niga. So first, the, the Swedish Center for Chemical Substitution. Um, Basically, what we try to do is to make it easier for companies and, and other organizations to get their work on, on replacing hazardous chemicals in order. And um, uh, we do this in four parts. We work with information and inspiration, try to raise the general awareness of chemical questions in, in societies and in companies. We um, give educational courses uh, and uh, we have a few films. We, we arrange seminars and workshops and we also uh, can arrange customized education. And then we have two little bit smaller parts where we work with the development of tools and implementation of tools, such as the alternatives assessment methodology that I will uh, talk a little bit about later. Um, uh, and we also take part in different research projects where our main task is to, um, apart from providing chemical ex expertise, or we usually uh, try to communicate results uh, with um, to, to make them the research results more more applicable for companies. And um, if you're interested in what, what we are doing, we have uh, quite a large website uh, where we have tried to collect um, all the kinds of information that you as company need to get working with substitution. Whether you are a, um, an expert in, um, in chemistry or if you're a company that needs to get started with substitution. So we have collected a lot of facts about substitution. We have a um, step-by-step substitution guide in how to, to start it identifying what substances you need to replace, how to find um, alternatives, how to compare and select alternatives and so on. And um, if, for instance, we talk about the tools and databases, we have tried to gather links to all the, the different databases, positive lists, uh, um, 
marketplaces and, and so on that you might find useful. Uh, I would like to say a few words about the, the first point here, the alternatives assessment, that is a methodology that we try to promote, that we find really useful for, for carrying out substitution work. And uh, alternatives assessment is a multidisciplinary method that describes a process for identifying, comparing and selecting safer alternatives to, to different chemicals. And the focus is on functional substitution, meaning that you have to broaden your perspective from just adding a drop in replacement to also con to consider other ways to achieve the same function. For example, by changing the material, changing the method or, or changing the process. But the, the most important thing here is to always start by asking yourself if the function of the chemical really is needed in the product or process, or if it can be excluded. So in the beginning of the process, you also set up goals, principles and decision rules that, that can guide you through the process. And the method also means that you in a systemic, a systematic way can identify and handle the pros and cons of different alternatives. So this method is something that I think some of you already use, but um, uh, for those of you who not use it already, I think I would really recommend that you look into it because it's an excellent way to, to have a transparent process when you consider different solvents, for example. So in summary, these are a few of the tools that we provide that I think you might find useful. Uh, we have the collection of databases and resources that you can find on our webpage. Uh, there's the alternative uh, assessment methodology, and we also have a, a free of charge introduction course to this method. Uh, we give that twice a year, and the next opportunity will be in October. And our courses are always digital, at least uh, uh, for the time being. And um, you can find more information about that in our web page. So those, those two areas are the sort of the, the free of charge services that we provide. Uh, we also have the possibility to give coaching and we are trying to develop a substitution course uh, coach for companies who try to get started uh, with going through their chemical work. And um, uh, we have a pilot underway and if you're interested in taking part of the pilot uh, free of charge you uh, can just contact me afterwards so that takes me to the second part of my presentation uh, this is like i said the result from uh, one of the technical projects that we have supported and that our rice colleagues have carried out it um, has been carried out by a team of researchers that have been led by Martin Andersson and Petro Niga. And I will only have the time to give a brief introduction to this tool. But if you would like to hear the full story, and I really recommend that because it's quite, quite nice, you can see a, a full version of um, the presentation of the rice substitution tool on our web page, and it's given by Martin Andersson. But I will give you a brief introdu introduction right now. And I will do this by an example where you want to replace xylene in paint. And of course, as you know, xylene is used as a solvent, but it has uh, uh, it has properties that are harmful both for environment and, and for humans. And um, therefore we would like to replace it. And this tool is also based on the Hansen uh, parameters uh, like uh, Christian was telling us about earlier on. Um, but of course, if you want to replace uh, a solvent in a product, you don't only want the solubility to be the same. You also want other properties for the function, such as perhaps a similar uh, evaporation pattern. You want it to dry, the, the paint should dry in a similar way as the, the original paint. 
you perhaps want a low melting point. You want to store the paint in a garage, for example, so you don't want it to freeze. Of course, the price is important and um, the order, perhaps. Uh, the customers may be sensitive to the order. And of course, above all, you don't want any solvent that it's equally hazardous or, or even more hazardous than the one that you want to replace. So when Martin and his colleagues used the tool in, in a similar way that, that Christian showed us, uh, we get a list of, um, of solvents that are close in distance in, in the uh, Hansen space. And here they have also added a few physical uh, data in order to reduce the list a little bit. So they have put on filters to, to find solvents that have a similar uh, evaporation point and a low melting point. And, and in that way, they ended up with these. I don't know if it's 13 or 14 different solvents. And of course, you can see uh, already here from the list uh, that some of these uh, compounds uh, or solvents are, are not very good uh, from a toxicological point of view. But what they do is they, based on the function that you need to, to, that you want to have in the paint, you filter out the, the alternatives that are no good in terms of toxicology, in terms of chemical properties, um, smell and price, and so on. So once we have singled out the solvents that are the best in terms of these parameters, we, they ended up with two alternatives to xylene, uh, amyl acetate and uh, N-propyl acetate. And these two are similar in solubility. The amyl acetate is sort of the winner in terms of solubility. It's the closest in, in Hansen space, but the other solvent is, is also a good solvent. Uh, uh, they both have a low price. They both can be found on a positive list, which means they are okay to use for, for, uh, from a human toxicology point of view. The amyl acetate has um, a, a health symbol for aquatic toxicity, but uh, in practice, the, in theory, the, the, the solvent is not going to end up in the aquatic environment, but in practice, we know that that might happen. Um, they both have sort of different smell compared to xylene. Uh, but um, in, 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 from a smell point of view, they are quite similar. But uh, just judging by the eye, uh, the end acetate seems to be the winner in comparing these solvents. But as Martin points out, um, you always have to go to the lab to try this in the end. So uh, what they would suggest the customer to do in this case is to try both these, um, these solvents in the lab. And if they are equal in function, the end propyl acetate probably should be chosen. But as I said, uh, this, this film that we have on our web page, it's really nice. And if you're interested in, in knowing more of the steps uh, with the, the substitution tool, I, I encourage you to have a look at this film. So that was all for now. And here are our content. Thank you, Anna. Great presentation. I just as a layman and really maybe I'm not understanding at all, but the tool that you are using, is it in any way correlating with the one from Umion? Of course, it's based on the same principles, yeah. uh, but um, this is uh, perhaps takes it a, a step further. And, and this is a, a service from RISE compared to the, the open access tool from Umeo. So uh, when you use this, you do that in, in co collaboration with a, a team of researchers and you go through the, 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 the question or the issue 
and you decide what parameters to, to take in to ensure the function. So this is this is maybe a second step. If, if you need to develop a new solution, if you don't find it using the free of charge tool, this is a good way to, to move forward, I would say. All right, so <clears throat> do we have any questions for Anna? I see we have some companies in that there's uh, there's been some people leaving us as we went along here, but uh, the majority is still left. We have some companies with us. We have Saab and ST Microelectronics, and we have uh, a few others. Uh, it would be interesting to hear your questions and your view on this. If there's anybody still around. All right. So, Ingela, um, perhaps Ursula, Duncan, do we have any specific topics? Anybody want to ask someone something? We had a discussion session um, uh, pointed out in the, the agenda. Duncan? Um, my name is Peter Norman. Can I just uh, put you a question? Please. Uh, I'm from Saab and uh, really nice to listen to to your presentation. And uh, <clears throat> I just have a question. If you compare these tools, uh, will we have the same results? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Anna, you, you mentioned two uh, alternative uh, solvents to Xylene. Uh, and if we use... Uh, uh, the 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 first tool uh, the, the tool that was presentation in the first uh, will we have the same uh, will we get the same uh, solution do you think what would you say Christian uh, as long as you you <coughs> use the same in data you should get the same output I would say but, yeah. but then it depends on how you select the criteria on how to exclude I mean you start with a, perhaps a, a long list and then you set your criteria on how to how to I can to, share to my screen determine maybe. the greenness for example yeah so while I was listening to the presentation I actually looked it up <laughs> to yeah, see if it was did. similar um, so you put in Siley, the thing I did, uh, I put the greenness up to seven. And then of course you, you could do something here as well to uh, refine the boiling point a little bit for that specific application. Uh, but basically what you see is that Silene disappears. This is not good enough, basically. It's not green enough based on their uh, requirements. But then you have this uh, isomule acetate you have there. Uh, mm -hmm. Which one was the other one? Propyl acetate, right? This one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. So you can see that they are in the list. Uh, there are a few other options available here, but it, it, it's like mm. you, it's like what said as well. You need to actually test this in the lab. So it's, this is no mm -hmm. guarantee that it will work. It's just uh, a ranking based on likelihood. And it, it's mm. a way to reduce the, the number of solvents that you need to try in the lab. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Real nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Ursula? Yeah, I can see also from the research point of view that we can use these uh, facilities uh, much more. And I think that that could be valuable for our industrial uh, partners and collaborators. Um, if we can also yeah give this yeah as we do with both these tools we get we get a feedback on how yeah how good <laughs> how green uh, the material is or the sol solvents is so i think that's a very yeah um, we can we can see that in our collaborations that uh, exactly those questions are arising uh, much more just this year compared to last year so it's uh, it's really up there. So I, I feel that, oh, yes, <laughs> we can combine this much more and, and use it uh, as well. So that's really neat. 
so thank you for for the yeah for the presentations there and the time can again don't be shy we're not that many <laughs> um i guess it's a question to you anna um i'm thinking about um generally substitution obviously to design a product or a material or a material that is included in the product it's a, a complex process so i was interested from your experience to hear what the time scale is uh, for uh, i know there's no typical projects of course but um um what the time scale is and um uh, how long uh, for the sort of validation phase when you actually make the substitution with the the project you've run together with with partners uh, first of all, I have to admit that we we do not run projects together with partners that much. We we mostly provide the the, the methodologies. We hope to do it more in future, but it um, it also has to do with with funding for the moment. Uh, it's a bit sad. What generally is said is that a, a substitution from Axe to bread or uh, grain to bread is could take five up to ten years if if you have to get uh, all all the data if you don't have the the toxicology data and you have to do um, validations and so on it's it's a fairly long process if you're not lucky that there is something really easy that you can do there are also those examples when you may you may have a process or a product where you have used you have the same recipe or the same technology or the same solution that you have had been using for many, many years. And, and then the, the uh, circumstances have changed. And when if you go through your process and, and really evaluate the function of different chemicals, maybe you find that something can just be excluded because it was added for a reason that is simply isn't there anymore. Thank you. I was wondering, we, we, we have had a lot of, uh, of focus now on, on, uh, on printed electronics, especially you, Christian, maybe. Uh, is, is that, um, uh, I mean, I, I guess, is, is the plan to, to go further and, and uh, uh, focus on other industrial sectors and, and uh, other, other usage of solvent cells? Uh, for our sake, we, we developed this mainly to solve our own problem, and we figured it was actually useful for others, so uh, that's why we published it. Um, we have some plans to include the uh, renewability of solvents as well into this. Um, but other than that, I don't think we have any direct plans to kind of yeah, expand, expand on it in, in terms of like, yeah, like you have in your toilet uh, with costs and odors, for instance, this is not something that's included in ours. Um, and we have no direct plan to, to include it either. Uh, in case of the rice tool, it's, it's also applicable for plasticizers and mm. additives in, mm. in uh, uh, polymeric materials. Mm. Uh, I, I just picked the solvent case to mm. show you here mm. today. Mm. All right. What do you uh, see as the next uh, the next step then in in uh, in uh, uh, as you 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 mentioned funding uh, <laughs> as a as a as a problem to 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 use this further and to 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 help out in 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 in, in getting more. Uh, uh, green in the usage of solvents. Uh, Actually, when I said this, I was referring to our road from mm. the substitution center. So we mm. are funded by the government and we need to do uh, activities that will support uh, all kinds of, of uh, actors equally. So therefore, we haven't had the possibility to work together with a certain company. But if, if you take it from Rice's point of view, of course, there. Um, there's no, no no difference, and if uh, if you should ask any of my rice colleagues here, they would say that uh, maybe if the funding then is is I think the awareness in companies has started to to uh, 
what do you say? It's growing really much right now. So two years ago, companies were probably not prepared to pay as much to develop new alternatives as they are now. And from my perspective, the, the perfluorinated uh, substances will be really important for companies. You find we see that there probably will be a group-wise regulation on, on PFAS, and you see PFAS in the media all the time. So that will be a problem for all kinds of companies who will have, because the, this, the, the perfluorinated uh, um, compounds, there are in all kinds of components, in, in vehicles, in, in um, single-use plastics, in, you find them everywhere. and, and no one has really kept been able to keep track of them. So I think that will be a, um, a challenge for industry later on. And I think there will be some focus on, on replacing them. It will be interesting to hear some, we have maybe some guests left from, from the industry uh, listening to this. Uh, what's, what's your point of view? What's, what's, uh, what's your next step in this? How, how aware are you? And, and what's, your, what's your limitations in... in uh, in uh, substitution uh, and so on. Uh, David, what do you say? You, you, were, you were discussing before. Yes, well, uh, I mean, we, we work at a fairly small company. We use a lot of inks. So uh, it's not really my job to, to choose a different solvent for the ink. Rather, I'm just choosing a different ink altogether. So I'm just trying to read the SDS reports and evaluate whether this ink is, is um, uh, harmful to our operators or not, or whether we should uh, wear face masks when we, we use it, or whether we should go and choose a different ink. So um, for me, that, that's the reason I raised this, this uh, question earlier, uh, asking how do you actually evaluate if, uh, if a solvent is harmful or not? I mean, it can say in the SDS that, that it has these pictograms uh, giving you warnings that it can, it can cause uh, harm to your uh, organs and, and um, all kinds of warnings. But it's always a, a matter of, of concentration. I mean, if, you have, if you're below um, the harmful dosage, then there's nothing to worry about. And if you're above it, you should certainly uh, use a face mask or, or uh, apply other precautions. But I, I haven't really found a good method of, of uh, of uh, evaluating that, I mean, you can you can you can only go so far as to calculate the concentration you ex would expect above the surface. But for instance, we have a, um, a screen cleaner that's sort of used for everyday use. We cl clean tables with it, and um, it contains uh, uh, heavy aromatic C9 aromatics. And uh, you can you can see that what, what the, I think is quite a low ppm because it's such a heavy uh, compound. Um, that you should, that is sort of the threshold limit uh, that you, you cannot pass. But it's very difficult to say if you inhale um, much of these aromatics when you use it, because it just says in the SDS report that you should, you should have a good ventilation in the room where you use it, and you should not breathe the fumes. And I've been in contact with the supplier and asking, what do you actually recommend here? I mean, uh, I, I don't want to force the operators to wear face masks because they use this every day and they can clean the tables with it. I mean, they can't walk around with face masks unless I know that it's absolutely necessary. And it's also not something that we can easily replace. This is a very sort of general use uh, screen cleaner that is useful that we need. So that's why I was asking if anyone has a good method of, of evaluating. What is the concentration you would expect in a normal room? We have quite good ventilation, but I mean, you're standing over a table with a cloth, a wet cloth, and you can smell the, the solvents. I mean, of course, you, yeah, it doesn't matter what ventilation system you have if you don't have a, like, a suction right above the cloth, which you don't for, for natural reasons. So what do you say? Do you, do you have a good way of evaluating this? I don't really have a good uh, good answer for you about this. I mean, even in the lab, you can work safely in a few months, for instance, and just manage the the, yeah, well, we, we, yeah. the vapor. So it's like yeah, yeah, it's like you say, you dilute it, and then the, the actual concentration is very low. So at some yeah. point, there is a 
uh, a value. But the, the, I think there is uh, there is at least some some values, where, some thresholds that you you should try to stay under. Uh, but I'm not sure how you would actually calculate that. Uh, I don't think you can calculate it. I mean, no, you it's tricky. You can't, yeah. you can't calculate. I mean, it's too it's too difficult <laughs> to calculate how the fumes will spread. Uh, it will de depend on room. where you are in the room as well. So, so. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And if you only calculate the concentration directly above the surface, you will be way above the threshold limit. But then mm. you're not supposed to put your nose directly on the wet cloth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the point of the tool, though, is uh, to kind of try to replace these. I mean, it's, it's like mm -hmm. it was said previously, it's like if, if you have, if these compounds that are in this cleaner, is, are they really necessary for the first part? Or can they be, can the same function be made with another compound? I mean, I know you're not yeah. the one who's replacing this now, but so. Yeah. Uh, we have the two hands. There could, there could be some other, yeah, some other products that could do the same thing, but with different, mm. less dangerous compounds. We have uh, Ursula and uh, Robert. I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer. Yeah, sorry, no. we have Ursula okay. and Robert Thank also you. wants to be in the same discussion, I guess, or, or uh, I don't know, uh, yeah. if you want to comment on something else, no? Yeah, it was it was in the neighborhood of this question, <laughs> the last question, but so I was just thinking of, uh, have, you, have you examples of how uh, much better the, comp the, the solvents can be by using the systems that you have been describing now, if we think that we have a like an indus industrial uh, user here that want to change their, I mean, how much can the system help out to to improve the solvents? And how can that be expressed? Is it by the green, uh, yeah, <laughs> the green label one, uh, or how is it? Anna, do you want to start? I'm thinking, I'm not the expert here since um, uh, Martin Andersson is the one who, who carried out the project, but I know in the film <laughs> that I keep talking about, uh, Martin gives an example uh, of how you can use this tool to make the product better. So mm -hmm. I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not suited to try to explain that, uh, but I think Actually, the, the alternative assessment methodology is, is a good approach because then you, you set from the beginning your own criteria and you try to find the, the mm. performance indexes that you want to have in your company. Maybe you would like to, to from my point of view, you would like to remove the, the harmful substances because you don't want to expose your, your co-workers to to dangerous substances and then, then you have to set up your own uh, criteria we don't want any uh, any solvents in our products that have uh, carcinogenic or mutagenic uh, properties i think that's the way to go to have your own follow-up of what you want to achieve Okay. So there is yeah. no like general uh, method of of, uh, of of measuring these effects you that you you're into, uh, Anna or or you, Christian, maybe. Yeah, Not apart I, from, I agree from with the, your, the, yeah. Sorry, the workplace I regulations, I would say, but maybe you know that better than me, Christian. I'm not so sure about that, uh, but uh, I mean, I I agree with uh, what you said. This is. Uh, this is about identifying what the problematic areas that you see in your own processes and see if there is something that can be improved. I mean, I talked about the, the hazard labels that you have on your on your bottles, for instance. Uh, maybe you want to remove a few of those, and this is this this could be a way to achieve that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, the the definition of greenness is a little bit blurry like I said as well. So it's it's a little bit hard to quantify uh, how how much of an improvement it actually is. Uh, you have to kind of set your own requirements there, I think. So it, it will be a little bit, little bit about, about your own definitions. Um, can, I, can I ask you, Christian, do, do you know already if some industry companies are using the tools or, I mean, the, and maybe for Anna as well, you mentioned that this hasn't really been your key focus, but, but I'm interested in, is it being used to some degree or? We have uh, about 
we have, we have a tracker on it so we can see the usage basically so we can we get the the amount of individual users per day i think it's about 10 worldwide uh, so it's not it's not super a lot but it's still more than i expected <laughs> i have to say uh, and uh, we've had uh, quite a bit of interest from uh, chemical manufacturers for instance solid manufacturers that have reached out to us because of this uh, publication and the tool uh, that are interested in in the results uh, yeah I'm not, I'm not sure if i should mention the names i'm not sure how the nda situation is about that but yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah, the same goes for rice. It, it is yeah. used for commissions on a regular basis, but I don't have any figures about that. I think Robert had a, a raised hand. I don't know if it's still... A... Yeah, I just had a quick question to Christian. Uh, you had a lot of solvents in the, the program. Uh, I guess they started out being the ones that you needed to replace or the ones that you we're going to be replaced with. Uh, is the plan to kind of expand it uh, and keep going? I didn't see, I only had a quick look, um, but I didn't see any ionic liquids on there. Uh, there are a few missing, yeah. These are mainly, uh, mainly solvents, uh, not so much acids and bases. It's not so much included. And like you say, ionic liquids, that's not included at all. So there are, there are, there are as well a few of them that would be nice to include that are still not there. Uh, uh, for sure, that there, you could make it better in that regard. Uh, I guess but there, there's, the list is quite big though, and uh, you can still, uh, uh, like there, there are variations of similar molecules, like ethylene glycol, for instance, you have, you have similar structures, you just add a methyl group, for instance, and it has pretty similar uh, properties. Uh, so you, you can you can base the Hansen parameters for quite similar compounds on uh, things that are close by, so to speak. Um, mm. So there, there are ways to go around it. But to do that, you need to know a little bit more, I guess. So the, the point with the tool is that it should be quite easy to pick up. You shouldn't really need to know so much about it. But if you're starting looking into that stuff, then you yeah you need to have some a little bit more background knowledge. I think. Yeah. yeah. No, but uh, super useful. Okay, I think it's about time to get some lunch and uh, to wrap up this. Uh, also, since the participants are disappearing as we go, I think uh, that's a clear indication. So I'd They're like hungry. to say, yeah, I'm hungry too. So I'm, I'd like, we have actually a hand raised here from Fine Cell Abir. Abir, did you want to say something? Yes. Seems like you're muted. Uh, yeah, yeah now. No. Oh, no. I was trying to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, everyone. I'm in the kitchen, as you can see, uh, working from home. But I, I want just to say before to Christian that this tool is really great. I would love to have this tool when I was doing my PhD because I did the bits part of this work, not in the same way, but just to be able to estimate what you have done, I think, with this tool. So I think it's great. And now in the industry, we really you need this kind of tool. Because now, for example, we are identifying uh, at my current work, we are trying to identify which kind of solvents do we need uh, like to uh, use in order to wash our product and to remove some of the organic acid that we have. And I think we will be really glad to use this uh, uh, this tool. And then another just like a point to answer another question. What I, um, then when we ask that, what, how could we um, identify if it's a place it's safe when we use a certain type of solvent? I think with the kind of tool that Christian developed, if we could use some AI to gather a lot of data and information regarding like um, area of work. I am in a lab. I'm using this kind of ventilation. This is the, the, the surface of the lab, the door that I have, how many windows do I have. If we can gather all this data plus the tool that Christian, uh, they developed at their lab, I think that we could have 
we could have this kind of system that will allow us to know when we are using uh, this solvent at a specific concentration with the specific ventilation and in a specific area, we could be able to know if it is safe or not and which kind of precaution we should use or we should have in this work area. But for that, we need to gather the information and also to analyze all the time the air to see what which kind of chemicals do we have in the air. So this is just like a small suggestion regarding the question that uh, you have asked before. Right. Yeah, I think respecting everybody's time, I think maybe we should finalize and conclude this now. Uh, and maybe that discussion could be directly with uh, Feinzel, Abir, and Christian, and to take it further in, in a yeah. different forum, mm -hmm. if if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, anybody who wants to hang out, you know, stay on Zoom, please. Please stay on Zoom. But I think for the rest of us, I'd like to say thank you very much for to the speakers, of course. And if you can share the presentations like in a PDF format, it would be great. But maybe you could send it out to the audience. And I'd like to stress that we had some pretty interesting players from Saab and Jemikali and Spakun and then the European Spallation Source and other players with us. So it, I think it was very, very quite fairly successful, this venture. Thank you also, Ingela, for hosting. We are, we are planning to uh, distribute the presentations once we get them from the speakers. And we are also uh, probably, I hope, uh, we have uh, also a film uh, so you can share it with uh, other persons in your networks also. So uh, that's uh, uh, hopefully taken care of. Uh, hopefully, yeah. So it was, it's, it's great. It's been a, a great a small touchdown in a very important issue, uh, and uh, and I'm really happy that we can use the, the arena for 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 these kind of discussions. So please uh, hang hang out there and and uh, get in touch with each other and with us if you have any other issues that we can discuss in the, the same way. Thank you for arranging this. It was really nice. Thanks very much. Well, it's been great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Bye. Really Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.